Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Inquirer Live. I'm Erin Haynes, contributing editor for the Philadelphia Inquirer's A More Perfect Union. And this is a series that's examining the roots of systemic racism in America through the institutions that were founded in Philadelphia. So today, for our latest installment, we included two articles, Indebted and Balancing the Equation, where we are exploring the history of higher education, its connections to the American slave trade and racism, and the ways in which these elite institutions are really looking to repair their failures. And so joining us for today's discussion are the writers for both of these articles in this chapter, Zoe Greenberg and Layla Jones. Zoe, Layla, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Wonderful. So listen, I want to get right into this uh, for people. And, and by the way, uh, I also want to tell the audience that we are going to take some questions from you all about this chapter. If you have not had a chance to read either Zoe or Layla's chapter, you can do that by going to inquire.com slash more perfect union. Uh, and so with that, I guess, uh, Zoe, I will start with you and just uh, tell me, I guess, a little bit about uh, why you wanted to write this chapter, uh, what your familiarity was with the University of Pennsylvania going into this chapter, and um, really what your goal was in, in, in reporting uh, this story, the way that you did, the way that you approached it. Talk to me about Indebted. Yeah, so Indebted is about the University of Pennsylvania, and I had sort of vaguely known that um, the University of Pennsylvania had basically denied any ties to slavery. It had said that it was on the right side of history when it came to slavery. Um, and, you know, to me, that kind of sounded right, like it's a, you know, northern school and historically Quaker state. And I thought, well, maybe that's true. Um, and it, it ultimately was not true that a group of students in 20. 17 began digging along with their professor, um, historian Kathleen Brown, and they basically found many ties that the university had not been, um, you know, upfront about. Yeah. Uh, and, and Layla, what about you? I mean, talk to me about, I mean, you, uh, if I am remembering right, came to Philadelphia to go to college. Yes. yes. And, and, and so talk to me about what your uh, your chapter, Balancing the Equation, uh, you wrote about Cheney University. Uh, what made you, <laughs> sorry, you guys, <laughs> allergies in November, that's kind of crazy. Uh, what made you uh, want to uh, approach this chapter the way that you did? And what is it that, that you end up saying in Balancing the Equation about Cheney? Yes. Um, so the reason that I want to write about Cheney University was because um, well, number one, I used to work at the Philadelphia Tribune, and um, the publisher went to Cheney as well as one of the colonists and probably some other people there, too. So I had a little knowledge about it. Um, but also, a lot of the news that I had seen in Ch about Cheney since I had been in Philadelphia had been rather negative. It had um, often cast the school in the lens of being at fault for its own problems. Um, and I knew that Cheney was, you know, called the first HBCU. And so I wondered if there were any historical inequities that may have contributed to um, any financial issues that the school was facing in the present day. And so I wanted to be able to try to dig into that for this for this sidebar piece. Yeah. And so Layla, tell me what you found. What, what is it that um, that readers can learn? Uh, by Just give them, give them a taste of what they can learn by reading about balancing the equation. Yeah, well, ultimately, I think what um, me and I worked with our research director, Brenna, and also another researcher named Abby, and I feel like what we were able to kind of discover is that Cheney's modern failures have been really kind of viewed in a vacuum in mainstream media in the most recent years, um, especially, you know, when their accreditation was at risk, and I think like 2015, 17, and 19, when it was finally restored. Um, but there were plenty of documented incidences of financial inequity and other kind of um, vague or hazy inequities that the school had faced at the hand of the city, um, the state, and even in some cases, the federal government um, that did ultimately kind of lead to the school over its 200 year history being treated differently than like um, primarily white institutions. Yeah, and I mean, just to stay with you for one more question, Layla, I, I mean, it, it sounds like uh, in through your reporting, you didn't just balance the equation, you really kind of helped to balance the narrative 
around Cheney and, and what maybe people might have thought about Cheney versus what the reality of, of this institution has been, what they've been up against, right? And how um, things have not been equal in terms of how they've been treated as an institution, as a higher, edu higher education institution. Well, yeah, I mean, I would hope so that that was able to happen. I feel like that was what, you know, yours and the Inquirer's in, um, intention was with the entire More Perfect Union project to kind of balance the narrative um, about these prominent institutions and their role in race. Um, so just, just because we can so clearly lay out instances, like, for example, when the Cheney, which was used to be called the Institute for Colored Youth, went to get funding from the city, it was denied funding because the city said that the lump sum was too large. However, another institution was already getting an amount of money that was more than, than Cheney had asked for. Then when they solved that problem, they said Cheney was a private institution, so it couldn't receive the money. However, other private institutions were already receiving money from the city. And so while Cheney or the Institute for Colored Youth never did get that funding, um, it's kind of unclear why, even I think of the writer at the time, this was 1898 to 1900, they said something like it was a mystery um, as to why the Institute was unable to get um, funding when some of these other institutions had. You're on mute, Erin. Sorry, that's uh, happens to me on Zoom all the time. I bet it happens to a lot of you out there too. <laughs> Uh, Zoe, just to stick with uh, kind of the, the topic of, of narrative, right? Uh, Penn recently had a story that it was telling about itself, right? That was not necessarily um, the full story of, 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 of uh, the University of Pennsylvania. That was something that you, I feel like, were, were really able to uncover so well in Indebted. And, and there was a historian that was kind of central to uh, your story, but also uh, a student who oh, whose own narrative was caught up in in uh, the reporting that you found. Can you talk a little bit about both of, of those subjects in your story? Yeah, one of the things that I was really interested in was kind of this narrative that the institution was telling about itself. And I spoke with um, a graduate student, now a graduate student named Van Jessica Gladney, and she kind of walked me through her own experience relearning sort of the narrative at Penn. She had initially told me that when she heard Penn say that there were no ties to slavery, she had felt kind of almost relieved by that. And, you know, she felt kind of virtuous about it. Um, and as she began digging in, she was one of the students who kind of began looking in the archives, began digging in. She realized that that story wasn't really true. And she felt, um, you know, a little like she had been misled or she had sort of um, thought the wrong thing. And so then she became very committed to um, telling the, the real story. What, and... Uh, I did speak with the archivist. Um, so I spoke with an archivist who was at Penn in 2006. He's no longer there. And he talked to me a little bit about um, in, in 2006, he told the student newspaper, you know, Penn's on the right side. Um, we, we don't know that there were any, um, no 18th century trustees were known to have profited from the slave trade. And he said that it was a moment when other universities were beginning to sort of delve into this, especially Brown University was one of the first. Um, and so he kind of shed some light on why he, uh, why he said that. And part of it had to do with the fact that the university had not, you know, appointed any kind of fact finding commission. They hadn't asked anyone to really get to the bottom of it. And he didn't think that history should be used to advance any kind of political cause. And he, he looked around in 2006 and he thought this is being used to advance reparations. And so in an effort to, you know, not have the history be used in that way, he basically, as he explained it, hedged and said, we don't know. And he didn't really know at that time. Leila, I see you shaking your head. I guess what 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 is that bringing to mind to you for you as 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 a journalist as as um you know as a Philadelphian as a as a black woman living in this country hearing what Zoe's saying about um about that archivist's argument. 
Well, me and Zoe talked about this while she was reporting it a lot. And I think that ultimately it is unbelievable that an institution as wealthy and powerful as Penn would rely on the word of one individual um, with regard to something as serious as their ties to slavery for several years. So the fact that they never did try to employ a fact-finding mission or provide any actually educated answer beyond this one man's response, which was based largely on his opinion of how history should be used in the present. I think it was like negligence. And I think that it kind of goes along with how part of racism in the country isn't necessarily just overt racism, but also ways where institutions can show that they don't care enough about Black people or Black history to invest any money or time into um, finding out the truth about different things. Yeah, and, and it does come down to uh, people making very deliberate decisions and choices, right, about about the truths that, that uh, are going to be told or that they think should be told and why, right? Uh, I mean, uh, this chapter is, is titled Indebted. Uh, I mean, we are having, I think, a conversation about what is owed, right? What's owed to, uh, the, the, what is owed to this community? What is owed to uh, Black folks uh, in this city? What, what, what is owed, uh, you know, to this country in terms of uh, what happens when we obscure this history? And, and what, is, what is the cost of obscuring this history? But also what is the cost uh, of, of really, uh, wow, it just got really loud all of a sudden. <laughs> the cost of, of unveiling that, that history and, and telling that fuller history. Uh, certainly it seemed like uh, there were folks within that institution that believed that there was a cost in telling that fuller history, right? And, and certainly, Layla, with, with your chapter too, uh, there's a cost about telling the truth about why things are the way that they are uh, in terms of the, the inequity uh, that, that exists uh, in terms of what's happening at Cheney University. Uh, I guess I wonder what both of you, uh, if both of you have thoughts about um, what is owed in, in either of those cases, what your reporting revealed uh, about kind of where we go from here uh, with those histories and also that legacy, which is continuing, it's ongoing today. <laughs> Okay, well, I think I'll start. Can y'all tell they work together? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that one thing that um, I learned a lot about while reporting about Cheney um, was the idea about equity versus equality. And so that's something that um, a, an advocate and activist for Cheney named Michael Cord really championed in um, the earlier 2010s when the school when he um, and a group that he was with relaunched a lawsuit against the state um, and other actors because of Chain, what they viewed as Cheney having been treated inequitably. And so the difference between equality and equity is, okay, for example, Cheney was a state school um, along with 13 other state schools. So when the state decided to raise tuition um, across the board at all the state schools, Cheney's tuition got raised. However, Cheney um, historically serves an underserved group of people, African-Americans, very much working class, a lot of times first generation. And so a study showed afterward that Cheney really bore the brunt of that tuition hike. It lost, I believe it was 50% of its um, student body or enrollment Wow. And the study did attribute that loss and a 66% rise in cost to those tuition hikes. Now, it wasn't unequal because everyone endured the hikes, but it was inequitable because it didn't take into account any other factors about the school, about the history of the school's funding and treatment, and about who the school served. So I think that while I have no idea what exactly Cheney deserves, and they are on a great path right now with a, a new president, some investment from the state, 5.5 million recently, and some other public-private partnerships. Um, so, I, But I think that equity should be um, considered 
above or in addition to or other than equality when it comes to schools like Cheney and Cheney University. And Zoe, what would you add in terms of what Penn is doing to really um, tell that fuller truth and address uh, the reality that, that, that uh, around their relationship to slavery and how they benefited from slavery? Yeah, I think one of the interesting things about doing this reporting side by side with Layla is that, you know, Cheney and Penn obviously had very different histories. They're different schools. And today they look really different. But I think sort of the big framework is which which schools were invested in and which were not. And so kind of looking at that in a big picture way, I think is helpful in terms of thinking through what are these schools owed now? Um, I mean, and what are and what are people owed now um, who were excluded, for example, from schools like Penn. Um, in terms of what Penn is doing, you know, they acknowledge the students' work and what the students had found about ties to slavery, but they haven't taken any of the steps that a lot of other schools have taken. So they haven't, um, you know, built permanent monuments on campus, sort of uh, commemorating some of that history. That's something that Princeton has done. Um, they haven't built a research center to study slavery. That's something that Brown has done. Um, they haven't set aside any money for restitution. That's something that Georgetown is, is doing. And um, when the article was published, they had not even joined this formal group called University Studying Slavery, which counts more than 100 schools as members. Wow, uh, well, we've already got some audience questions that are starting to come in. I just wanna remind everybody that's tuning in that you can submit questions for Layla and Zoe, and we'll try to get to as many of those before the end of our conversation as possible. But thank you for everybody that's already uh, not only listening to this uh, great conversation, but is also asking questions about these chapters and for reading uh, Zoe and Layla's excellent work. Uh, I, I also want to ask um, both of you, I guess, was there anything that surprised you in what you learned reporting on either one of these chapters? Or were there, was there a moment when one of you called the other and was like, can you believe, you know, I just had this interview or I just had this, just just found this, um, found this, this thing out in, in the course of reporting that really surprised you about uh, either of the institutions that you were reporting about? I mean, when I I can say one of the things that I found really interesting and Layla and I did talk about was one of the students that I spoke with, her name is Brianna Moore. She was able to trace her family um, back and she learned she's a black woman who was a student at Penn. Now she's getting her PhD there. And she learned that her family members were enslaved by Penn alumni. And she was able to do this really kind of incredible research tracking the specific people and sort of um, she was able to show, you know, how many enslaved people they had, what years they went to Penn and basically show the way that um, the way that slavery, you know, literally was the staggering transfer of wealth away from her relatives. And, you know, she could see all of their names on the will mm -hmm. to this other family that then attended Penn. And she talked about how it took, um, it took over a century, actually almost two centuries for someone in her family to attend this Ivy League school when, you know, her family's enslavers attended, you know, hundreds of years ago. Yes. No, that is, that is pretty incredible. Uh, Layla, what about you? Um, yeah, I think that there are two instances that jumped out with regard to my reporting that I found surprising. One was super early on at the onset of Cheney when it was called the Institute for Colored Youth. It was started by Quakers who are known to be tolerant, abolitionist, anti-slavery, um, and its students were Black boys who were orphans. And so they were indentured to the school, which meant the school had control and care over them. And they were indentured until they were 21 years old. Um, but at an equivalent school for white children in Philadelphia, Girard College, um, at, when it started, it was for white orphan boys. And those students were only indentured until they were either 14 or 18 years old. And so I was um, taken aback by the fact that even the Quakers who had this, this modern, really good reputation for being um, 
abolitionists and, and wanting equality, they didn't operate equally, equally or equitably even at the beginning of the school's um, onset. And the second thing that I found interesting um, was that when a federal um, report came out in 1969 and found that Pennsylvania was operating in an unequal system of higher education, um, a segregated system of higher education, the solution to that was to uh, mandate that Cheney became 30% white instead of kind of mandating more equality and equity across the other schools. They were only charged with becoming four to 15% people of color. So um, obviously that put an unfair burden on Cheney and eventually that mandate was dropped, but it took years. <laughs> wow, yeah, I mean, yeah, that was, that was definitely one of the things that I remember reading like, wow, like I did, I, I did not realize that about, about Cheney. So I guess the last thing I wanna ask both of you, just for people who um, may not have been following the project, I mean, both of you have written several uh, of the chapters in this series so far. Talk about why um, really the institution of, of higher education and the inequality in higher education, why that felt like an important institution for us to have in the series, why you think it matters, why, why it should matter really for our democracy and our society to be having this particular conversation as we discuss uh, how we perfect our union. Um. Well, <laughs> I think one of the things um, that is really fundamental is that these are the institutions that are involved with producing knowledge and sort of understanding what's happening in the world. And so it's almost like a, a meta um, situation that's happening within the institutions where they're trying to both understand and, you know, for example, in the case of Penn, sort of they're trying to not understand um, the history. And there are people within the institution that are sort of saying, you know, it's our job as historians and as students and as part of a university that produces knowledge to really look into this and to really look at the truth. So um, I think that's one of the, you know, reasons that it's a really interesting subject. Um, and I would say from the point of view of Cheney and of HBCUs, I think it's important right now um, because Cheney was created not even as a university on the level of Penn, but in 1837. And that was a hundred years after um, Penn was created. Um, and Penn calls itself the first university. There were some that were earlier, but anyways, um, some colleges that were earlier. But the point is that um, there wasn't even a, close to an equivalent to a Penn or a Harvard or a school that um, barred Black people from learning until a hundred years later. And then in 1854 with Lincoln University, which also was in Pennsylvania. And so I think that when you really talk about achievement um, in education and other realms of society, um, you should, again, look at what the truth is in the country, which is that Black people in the realm of education did not have an equal shot for hundreds of years where white people in the country were already practicing medicine, you know, from an institution like Penn. Yeah, uh, both of you both each make such really good points. And yeah, I mean, I think I would just add to that, that, you know, it does mean something to, to be a first or even to claim to be a first, right? Like that, that means that you are looked at as a pioneer, you're looked at as a leader. And, and what happens uh, in that institution can can really set the tone for, for every other um, iteration of that institution that comes behind them. And so that is certainly part of why that matters and why that matters in higher education, right? Uh, okay, so uh, with that, I think we're gonna take a few questions from the audience here. So thank you all for submitting these questions. Uh, the first question, uh, I think this is for you, Zoe. Any suggestions for getting a university to sign on to the universities studying slavery group? So the university studying slavery group, it's run by the University of Virginia and that's the consortium of schools that I mentioned that has more than a hundred schools as members. 
Um, and in 2018, Penn promised to join um, in response to the Penn and Slavery Students research. Um, they had not joined, although I believe that they are now in the process of joining, which has coincided nicely with this story, coincidentally or not. <laughs> um, so I think they are in the process of joining and um, I think for, for universities that are doing this research, you basically just have to show some of the research that you're doing. Well, that's a, thank you for that update, Zoe. That is, uh, we'll have to stay tuned to see what, what comes of that, right? Because uh, certainly it sounds like they uh, qualify to be involved in such a, such a group. Uh, we have another question. Uh, Zoe, do we know if any, or, or either Zoe or Layla, were any state universities involved in having slaves to help build buildings uh, here in Pennsylvania? And do, do we know which ones, if, if there were? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I don't think I know. I mean, I would, I would honestly check out that University Studying Slavery um, Consortium. But um, yeah, I think, I think the sort of takeaway from Penn is that, you know, even schools that seemed very far or unlikely to be involved in some way in the slave trade were potentially, I mean, this was the greatest wealth producer in early America. So it's likely that it touched institutions that needed a lot of wealth, um, but they, they were involved differently. So, I mean, Penn, for example, did not as a university own people and it did not um it, it did not like georgetown you know sell people to save the university it, it wasn't involved in those ways and uh just uh one more from from lola khan although i don't, I don't know that either of you can necessarily answer this one but i think uh I, i'll i'll uh put it out here to, to uh to the group anyway, uh, Lola is, is saying, you know, why haven't the white universities given free education to black people? Uh, the universities uh, sold slaves, like you were saying, about Georgetown to stay open, and now they're challenging affirmative action. I think this is an, in it's interesting that we're having uh, this chapter uh, really is happening at the same time that, that the country, right? The Supreme Court literally is, is hearing a case on affirmative action and kind of um, what gets to count, what, what, whose identity is valued and, and what legacies we consider when we consider um, trying to create more equitable conditions in, in higher education. Yeah, I know, I know that Georgetown in particular is kind of um, doing a model of this where they have off, they are raising money to benefit the descendants of people who were sold by the school. Um, and they're sort of in the process. They haven't actually distributed the funds yet. It's been sort of a long drawn out and somewhat controversial process, but they are trying to actually do that type of, of reparations work. Well, it's almost time for us to get out of here, but I want to ask both of you if you have any final thoughts on the chapters that, that you wrote, if uh, you think there's anything that you want uh, our audience or readers to take away from, from um, the articles that each of you wrote. Uh, I'd love for you to share that here. Um, well, I would like for readers to take away um, that Cheney has been a very resilient and ultimately successful institution in light of the different things that it faced throughout its nearly 200 year history. And um, so basically, even though it was never, it wasn't always given a fair shake, um, the fact that the university started as a, a boarding school for black orphan boys in 1837, and now has this sprawling campus um, in Cheney, Pennsylvania, is really a testament to the work that a lot of the people at the school did, um, the black teachers and principals um, over the centuries. And as for me, I think one of the most interesting things that I learned from reporting on this is the way that um, universities, institutions kind of try to parse their history in certain ways to sort of hold up some parts of it and um, ignore other parts. And so 
I think that's a really useful thing to sort of keep in mind as we're seeing what, you know, what institutions say about themselves. And there are sometimes people within those institutions that have a different story to tell. So, yeah. Well, history can never just be about what makes us feel good, right? Um, I want to thank both of you so, so much for helping us to reckon with the histories of both of these institutions and also their legacies uh, so that we can begin to think about what the way forward is around uh, inequity in, in our higher education system in America uh, through the lens of, of, of both of these pioneering institutions. So Zoe, Layla, thank you for your continued work in this series and thank you for these latest chapters in A More Perfect Union. And thank you to our audience so much for joining us for the Inquirer Live's latest installment of A More Perfect Union. Uh, thank you again to our guests for joining us today. Uh, to read Zoe's article, Indebted, as well as Layla's article, Balancing the Equation, and all the previous articles in A More Perfect Union, uh, you can visit inquirer.com slash moreperfectunion. Uh, you can also sign up. We have a free newsletter uh, that will give you uh, notifications about our future articles as they're being published. Uh, again, I'm your host, Aaron Haynes. I'm a contributing editor for More Perfect Union, and I hope to see you next time on Inquirer Live. But in the meantime, have a great evening and go Phillies.